So we already talked about how we do hypothesis testing for um, means when we know the population variance and also proportions. So what we're going to look at instead today is not a proportion example. Um, oops. But we're going to look at an example where we need to do a hypothesis test for an unknown population mean based off of a sample mean, but we don't know the original population variance of the data we sampled from. So the steps are going to look pretty similar. We first figure out what our null alternative is. Do we have a left, right, two-tailed test? We then have to figure out, okay, what level of confidence or what significance level are we going to be doing this hypothesis test for? Now, in practice, hopefully at this point, you can kind of see, you know, if we use the p-value approach or critical value approach, you can compare or you can look at several different significance levels pretty easily um, simultaneously. We're then going to calculate our test statistic, but it's going to look a little bit different than before. We now, instead of calling it a Z statistic, we call it a T statistic. So if we remember from confidence intervals, anytime we don't know the population variance and all we have is our sample variance, <clears throat> excuse me, that's going to um, result in that we have a different distribution when we subtract the mean and divide by the standard deviation of our sample means. I'll rewrite this here in a second. So it's going to look very similar to what we were doing before. It's just now we're using a sample variance. We said the same thing with confidence intervals with hypothesis testing. Since we're using the student T distributions, we need to know which distribution do we are we using, and that's based off of our degrees of freedom. Our degrees of freedom is simply, I don't think I have it written down here, but just simply N minus 1. Okay. So let me go here. Oh, you don't want to look at me. So here we go. Um, <clears throat> you know, just to kind of point out what we were we were doing before, we had oh, there we go. We had a z statistic. We were going to take the sample mean that we found, subtract the hypothesized true mean, and then divide by the standard deviation of our sample means, which was the square root of the original population variance over the sample size. When we don't know the population variance it no longer is going to be when we subtract the assumed true mean and divide by the standard deviation it'll no longer be standard normally distributed but it'll come from a student t distribution but you'll notice it looks almost identical in fact it's really the same setup it's just now we're using a sample variance to calculate the standard deviation of our sample means okay. but everything else all the rules of the p value all the rules of the critical value approach everything stays exactly the same okay <clears throat> Excuse me. So let's go through an example. All right, well, let's assume you want to test the hypothesis. The average home value in Muncie is different than 90,000. So Muncie's a, a town in Indiana. I had some data on it, so I was using these values. Um, so we want to know, is it any different than 90,000? Well, it seems pretty low, but maybe it's a fairly impoverished area. So you take a sample of 51 homes and you, you know, find, oh, man, the average is only 85,000. So can I, with 90, 95, 99% confidence, based off of my sample mean of 85,000, reject this assumed true value, oops, sorry, of 90,000? Well, first of all, what would my null alternative be? If I just want to know, is it different than a certain value, so that different than, we said that always tells us it's a two-tailed test. So we know that we're going to assume that it's equal to a specific value because we wanted to know, is it different than 90,000? That's what we want to try to test, our alternative hypothesis. So we assume the opposite is true, which is that it's exactly equal to 90,000. Okay. So now we've got a two-tailed test. What would my test statistic be? This is really, you know, you're going to have that formula sheet. It's just a matter of plugging our values in, right? Um, you know, you've got a sample mean of 85,000, assume true mean of 90, sample size of 51, sample variance of 100, what, 100 million, right? So I just go ahead, plug all those values in, right? So we found our sample mean was 85,000. Assumed true mean was 90,000. 100 million was our sample variance over our sample size of 51, right? <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, one thing to point out here, once we go to look at kind of what our critical values are, we're going to need to know in our p-value, what is our degrees of freedom, it's simply our sample size minus one. Now, if we go back to those answers right away, I know that my test statistics should be negative because I was assuming it was 90,000 and I found something below that. So the sample evidence I found should be a certain number of standard deviations below that assumed true value. 
So if we look here, right? Positive doesn't make any sense. And I think if you plug it in, you end up finding, yeah, negative 3.57, okay? Okay, so we had this example. Um, oops, I didn't want to do this yet. Uh, keep it on here, there we go. <clears throat> Where we had this test statistic, and I believe it was negative 3.57. Our degrees of freedom should be our sample size minus one. So we should have a degrees of freedom of 50. Okay. So if we want to remember what we're doing, here's our test statistic. If I was looking for a p-value, it's the probability that I saw, remember what is our null? It's that the mean is equal to 90,000. If that in fact was the true mean, our sample means should be distributed normally around that true population mean. Well, we're assuming that it's 90,000. We found sample evidence of 85,000. When we turn that into a test statistic, now no longer a Z statistic, but a T statistic coming from the student T distribution, we found negative 3.57. So the probability we saw sample evidence as inconsistent with what we assume to be true or something that was even more inconsistent we might initially think it's just going to be this area under the curve to the left of our test statistic, right? Sample evidence that goes against our null or evidence that goes even more against it, right? However, for a two-tailed test, just because I found sample evidence below, it would have been equally as likely I had seen a sample mean that was that same distance, but above that true mean. So it was equally as likely for me to find every value in this range so for my total p-value, I'll find the area in this left tail, and then symmetric distribution, it'll be the same area in this tail, I multiply it by two. So what does that look like? Um, I head it over here. Now you can use this. I'm going to show you how to do this in Excel as well. So really whatever is um, easiest for you, but I'll show you both methods. Yeah, make sure this is sharing the right screen. So here is not our standard normal distribution table, but our student T distribution table. Just as kind of a reminder, here's the different areas in the tail. Here's my different degrees of freedom. Now, this is only going to show me the right side of the distribution. So these are all positive values. But just like the standard normal, our student T is symmetric. So if you wanted, say, like a left-tailed test, and I had a test statistic of, I don't know, negative 1.4145, I would just look up right here, this degrees of freedom test statistic, what's the area in that tail? It you know should be the same as the area to the right of the positive value, should be the same as the area to the left of the negative value. Yeah. So we have negative 3.57, but our degrees of freedom was what, 50? So we gotta scroll down here, okay? Degrees of freedom of 50. Well, notice if I'm thinking about, okay, what area, right? Or what would my area in the to the left of negative 3.57 be? Well, the area to the left of negative 2.6 is 0 0.005. So it's something pretty small, right? Something less than 0 0.005. So I'm thinking about this area. It's less than 0 0.005, which means this area is less than 0 0.005. So my total p-value, if this area is less than 0 0.005, this is less than 0 0.005, should be something less than 0 0.01. I'll show you how to find it exactly in a second, but even with this information, you know, let's just sort of give it, if I know it's less than 0 0.001, let's just give it, I don't know, a value just so we can think about it. Well, when do I reject the hypothesized true value? When do I reject my uh, null hypothesis? Whenever my p-value is less than alpha? Well, my conventional alpha is 0 0.1, 0 0.05, 0 0.01. My p-value is going to be less than all of those, so I can reject at every single significance level or at every level of confidence, okay? All right, so I will also show you how we do this in Excel because you'll notice student, you know, the student T table is kind of limited. We said the standard normal is limited to two decimals, but you know, this is limited to really only what, six different areas in the tail? What if I wanna be a little more precise, right? So what we're gonna do is use Excel and I'm going to, Oh. There you go. As I say, that should be the, there. We go. Zoom in. Um, now let's say I have a student T value. That's what my 
test statistic is, it's comes from the student distribution, it's the number of standard deviations away my sample mean was from the assumed true population mean. So my T value, X here, I tell it the T value I found, which was negative, what, 3.57, comma, what was my degrees of freedom, 50. And then just like the normal distribution, do I want it to be cumulative, right? Do I want the area to the left or, or, or non-cumulative? We don't really ever use the non-cumulative option. So comma one. This should give me the area, that area to the left of negative 3.57. Sure enough, it's something less than 0 0.005, much less. But my total p-value, remember, would be this times two. So I could use this to be very precise, look up any test statistic. Now, one thing I'll have to be, be careful about, let's say I had found a test statistic of a positive 3.57. Okay, so I use that t.disc function. I tell it 3.57 comma degrees of freedom is 50 comma one to make it cumulative. Well, what this would do is give me the area to the left of 3.75. Remember, if I did find a positive test statistic with a two-tailed test, I actually want the area to the right. So, you know, if I take this and multiply it by two, does that even make sense? I'd have a p-value, which is a probability that's greater than one. That doesn't make any sense, right? Highest probability could ever be is one. Oh, that's because I have the area to the right. So how do I get the area to the left? One minus that. Okay. Now that I have that area, okay. Now I multiply by two to get my total p-value. Okay. All right. So that's one example. Let's do another one. So let's say I've got the Indiana birth data again, and I want to know if the average pregnancy is less than, in Indiana is less than the national average, which is 3,297. So I take a sample of 400 births, pretty large sample size, and I find that the sample mean is 3,132, and I have a sample variance. I don't know the population variance here. So what's my null alternative? What was I trying to find? What was I trying to test for? That the average, sorry, um, the average Oh, wait, to people who were using alpha during pregnancy, um, I want to know, is it less than the national average of 3,287? So I should hopefully be having that value in my null alternative. This is what I want to test for. That's my alternative hypothesis. So is it less than that value? I assume the opposite is true. So here's what I assume to be true. The mean is greater than or equal to that value of 3,287. I find some evidence that it is not greater than that. I find evidence that actually supports the alternative. But is it strong enough evidence that I can reject this null, right? So here, if I look at my alternative hypothesis, I've got a less than sign, so left-tailed test, right? What would my test statistic be? Once again, this should be just kind of easy as plugging and chugging, right? I've got my... Oh, I know I put it away here. Hold on. <laughs> I've got my test statistic equation. It's just a matter of plugging in that sample mean, that value that comes from the null hypothesis, Sample variance, sample size. Now here, my degrees of freedom, I think we had what? 400 was my sample size. So my degrees of freedom is only 399. One thing we said about the student T is that as you get higher and higher sample sizes, it essentially converges right, to the standard normal. So we'll kind of see this here in, in just a second. So let's go back here. All right, so once again, we found sample evidence that was below the assumed true value, so we should have a negative test statistic. <clears throat> sure enough, when we plug our values in, we get about negative 4.6. And you can imagine, you know, we just found a test statistic of like negative 3. This is even larger, even further away from that, that assumed true mean or, or assume, away from that middle of the student T distribution of 0. Our p-value is going to be pretty small here. But I can be kind of very precise. So what would the p-value be? What are critical values? And what levels can we reject at? Okay, I don't think I have, yeah, I left it blank because I wanted to just show you how we do this. So I would personally do this in Excel every single time just to make it easier on yourself. You can, by all means, use this. The problem is, okay, what degrees of freedom do I use? I've got 399. Okay, I'm somewhere in between here. You know, my test statistic is four. I mean, this only goes up to 2.5, 2.6. So I know from this, you know, I'm looking around my degrees of freedom. So let's say I even kind of go with a lower value of 200. Well, the area to the left, or sorry, the area to the right of positive 2.6 is 0 0.005. So I can kind of do what I did in the, some, the previous problem and say my p-value is going to be less than 0 0.001. But let's say we had a test statistic that was something different. Um, and I'll give you one just to kind of play around. So let's say we only found a test statistic, of, I don't know, 
1.76. Okay. So I'm just going to label these things as we kind of work through this example. So here's my test statistic. Well, I want to find my p-value. Now I have a left tail test. So really all I want now with a left tail test, we can think about the distribution of my sample means should be normally distributed. And I had this assumed true population mean. Let's see if I can remember these numbers correctly. <laughs> the sample mean was 3,132. So when I turn that into a test statistic, the probability that I saw sample evidence as inconsistent with what I assumed to be true. Now remember this time, If I found sample evidence on the other side, it actually supports the null. So the only sample means that would go against the null as much as what I found is anything that's even further away from that assumed true mean. So we turn that into a test statistic and we want to find the area to the left. I said, let's assume that instead we found that test statistic was negative 1.76. Okay. If that's the case, what's the p-value? We can use that t.dist function, select our test statistic, comma, what was our degrees of freedom? Remember, we had 400 was our sample size, so 399. And then comma one, I wanted the area to the left. This should give me my p-value, which I can then look, oh, okay, I can compare this to several different alphas, right? Is it less than an alpha of 0.1? Yes. So I can reject the 90% level. So here we have a p-value of 0.039. Approximately. So at the 10% significance level, what's our level of confidence and what's alpha, right? So 90% confidence level, alpha is 0.1. Is our p-value less than that? Yes, so we can reject, right? So remember, we always reject if our p-value is less than alpha. What about the 5% significance level or 95% confidence level? Alpha is 0 0.05. Our p-value is less than yes, so yes, we can reject. What about the 1% or 99% confidence level? Alpha is 0 0.01, not quite less than that. We would fail to reject the null with 99% confidence, okay? Now, we said we also, instead of using the p-value approach, which I think that one's, to me, it's a little bit easier, but what we can do is say, okay, what if I find the critical value associated with having 0 0.01, right, or alpha in the in the tail, whatever that value is, here's my rejection region, then I find critical value for 0 0.05, rejection region, critical value for 0.1, rejection region, I then plot my test statistic to see where it's at. So how can I find these critical values, or essentially like work in the opposite direction? So if I wanted critical values here, and how do I arrange this? I'm going to move this over. So my critical value for the three different levels of alpha, right? So what value would give me 0.1 in that lower left tail? So instead of t.dist, we'll now use t.inb. Tell it the area that we want in the tail, comma, tell it our degrees of freedom. I believe it's 399 here. Hit enter. I then, I'm going to just copy this down. It updates the alpha that's using. Here's my three confidence interval, interval the confer, critical values very quickly. Sorry. Right. Now, if I had a right tailed test, I would use the same method. But when I look at these, I have to remember oh, yeah, I'm not looking at the left side of the distribution. I'm looking at the right side to be these same exact values, but positive. Okay? And then what if I wanted a two tailed test? So let's say we did that in the previous problem. I had the same alpha values. What would my critical values be here? Well, remember, with a two-tailed test, we have a total of alpha would be like in our tails. So the amount that we want in each tail would be half of alpha. Okay. So remember, we're only critical values for a two-tailed test. Let's say I, I wanted 0.1 total in my tails. That means that it would be 0 0.05 in each tail or half of alpha. So we can use the exact same function in Excel, t.inv. We're just now going to take that area we want in the tail, divide it by two, comma, tell our degrees of freedom. Now notice here, I've got my negative critical values, but for 
two-tailed test, we have two critical values, right? One negative and then the same value, but positive. So I'm just gonna take the absolute value there. We've now got our pairs of critical values at each alpha, okay? Um, what else do I wanna point out here? Oh, I know. Um, you can also, just to kind of show you here, another way of finding critical values, you can use that t dot v dot two t. Oops, if I can use my parentheses, there we go. There, you only have to tell it the total area you want in both tails, so just alpha, three ninety nine, and it will divide alpha by two for you and give you that same value. Although when you use the dot two t option, it always gives you the positive value, right? Um, so that's another way of doing the same thing. I don't know, this kind of lines up with more how you would do it by hand. So maybe it's easier to think about it this way. Um, you can also just to you know be clear, how did I find my P value? I use that T dot dist and I multiplied it by two, right? For a two tailed test. Let's say instead I wanted to, oh, there it is, dot two T, right? I can just tell it, here's my test statistic. Here's my degrees of freedom. Oh, why didn't it like that? Oh, because when I tell it, the, the dot two T one, it only wants positive test statistics. So it doesn't matter because it's a asymmetric distribution. So I'll just use the absolute value. Now notice here, I actually forgot. I think I was using this for the one tailed test. If this was a two tailed, here we go. Sorry, let's go up here. This was the two tailed test one, right? Where I then multiplied it by two. So let's go um, T dot dis dot two T what was this 3.57 negative 3.57 so i'll use the absolute value of that and this was 50 from the previous problem oh why didn't it like that oh because i can't type this is top 2t i get the same value right um so there's different ways of doing the same thing and that is how we can use either the p value or critical value approach to really compare it to, you know, several different levels of confidence pretty quickly. Right? And we kind of work through all these, you know, by hand, but also in Excel. So you know how to have this to go back to. Okay. Let's see. I think I've got one more example here. And we'll just work through one more. So let's say I had maybe a little bit more. Oh, interesting. And I'll point something out here when we go back to Excel that I mentioned earlier that I, I said I'd bring up. So we've got a battery life and we want to know... Oh, the manufacturer claims it lasts twice as long, so not four hours, but eight hours. A researcher samples 30 new phones and finds a sample battery life of 8.9. Okay, so we wanted to see is this average battery twice as long or more, so eight or greater. So we have a right-tailed test there. We'll write this down in a second. I found sample evidence that is above that assumed true value of eight. 8 8.9 was my sample mean. I have a sample, all I have is a sample standard deviation, so we want to be careful here. And let's do our hypothesis test at the 90% confidence level, okay? So this is for the Excel stuff we're gonna do. So we'll, we'll finish this one out first, okay? Um, all right, so here's our equation for our test statistic. Remember, we want to test for whether or not this average battery life is greater than eight hours, which means we assume the opposite is true. So here, I've done the left tail, the two tail, now we have a right tail test, okay? So this right tail test, if this assumed true value of eight is in fact the true population mean, then what's the probability we saw the sample mean that we saw, 8.9? So sample evidence that was as inconsistent with what we assume to be true or something even more inconsistent. So now this area to the right represents my p-value. Once I turn this into a test statistic, I've got what? 8.9 minus eight. I think I said the standard deviation was 2.1. So you can do this one of two ways. I think I have two versions on the formula sheet. Another way we could have rewritten this, I'm taking the square root of something squared. So the standard deviation, divided by the square root of n. So here I've got a standard deviation of 2.1. Sample size was 30. This should give me my test statistic, right? So I don't know what that is off the top of my head. And I didn't put it in the slides. So let's have <laughs> Excel do this for us, right? So we had what? 
8.9 minus 8 divided by 2.1 divided by the square root of 30. Just using Excel to be my calculator. So here's my test statistic. If I then wanted to find my p-value, remember that's the area to the right of my test statistic, t dot dist, and I've got a right-tailed test. So one thing, I, I'll show you two different ways. You can use this t dot dist and say, okay, look, here's the value I want to find the area to the right of, comma, my degrees of freedom was, what well, the sample size was 30, so 30 minus 1 is 29. If I do comma 1, though, it's going to give me the area to the left of this test statistic. I want the area to the right, so what do I do? Oh, I subtract that from 1. Right? Now, what I can also do is use this t.dist.rt. Now, if I do this, all I have to remember is that when I give it the test statistic, it, just like the t, using the dot 2t, it always has to be positive. It, it, you, know, you should only be using it when you have a positive test statistic anyways. You get the same value. Okay. How do I then find my critical values? Same kind of idea. So I can use the t.dist function, or sorry, t.inv. We're working in the opposite direction now. I think we said we were doing this with an alpha of 0.1. Right? So that's the area that we wanted in the tail. Degrees of freedom of 29. The only problem is this t.inv, it always accepts this as like the area in the left tail. So it'll give me the critical value, but it'd be negative. So I could simply just, oh, okay, I know it's going to be that same value, but take the absolute value and then close my parentheses for me. Now I can also use this t.inv. Actually, I thought there was a, no, I can't. Yeah, so that's actually the only way I can do this. <laughs> I thought that there was a t.inv.rt, but apparently not. So, um, you just have to remember that additional step, which is, yes, you can use t.inv to find the critical value for a right tail test, but it's that value, but positive. Well, test statistic here is much greater than my critical values, clearly in the rejection region. So at the 10% significance level, I can reject my p value is less than 0.1. So I can both ways lead me to thinking I should be able to reject this hypothesis test. Okay. So three different examples, the different three different types of tailed tests that you can do when you have a um, sample mean, and you only have a sample variance. I'll also do one more video for this chapter that has an example uh, fully worked out in Excel for each one of these different types. Mean where you know the population variance, proportions, sample mean where you only have a sample variance.